And we are live, ladies and gentlemen. We are live. This is your friend, Charlie Hunter, with another reasonably fine art talk. I'm up here in Bellows Falls, Vermont. The great Betty Sue is on the train, heading north as we speak. Kat Charbonneau is here helping me. Um, he may knock some things over during the talk. And we have a very, very special guest today. We have a very special guest today, and we're going to get down into the weeds talking about Cobra water mixable oils with our good friend with our good friend, Mr. Jeff Olson. Of Royal uh, Charlie, thank you for having me today. Great to be here. It's a delight to have you here. Now, Jeff, ladies and gentlemen, Jeff is on the road to recovery from back surgery. So it's good to see you up and about, Jeff. Ah, uh, it's great to be back, getting stronger every day. Good. So, so today we're gonna, we're soliciting all you folks out there in internet land, put up your questions, put up your questions about Cobra water mixable oils. And Jeff and I will do our best to unravel the mystery. But before we get into answering the questions, Mr. Olson has prepared a short slideshow for us. So I'm going to take a back seat here, turn it over to Jeff. Take it away, sir. Take it away. Awesome. awesome. Happy to. Yeah, I put together some information uh, that I thought would be great to get started with, a little bit about what water mixable oils are, how they work, the history of them in the painting, oil painting tradition, uh, and then hopefully uh, dispel some of the myths that are out there that surround this wonderful uh, way of painting. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through the slides uh, with Charlie. Um, go ahead and put your questions in. Then of course, at the end, we'll have lots of time for Q&A. So first of all, what are water mixable oils? So let's define them. Um, they are referred to as water miscible, sometimes as water soluble. Uh, they're a revolutionary paint, and they have all the characteristics of traditional oils, but without the need for harmful solvents. So water mixable oils are genuine oils. This is one of the big uh, misnomers out there, that they're somehow a different type of paint. They're a genuine oil. They're formulated with a drying oil binder. Uh, Cobra, we use linseed oil, so the same uh, binder that we use in Rembrandt oils, for example. But unlike traditional oil paint, the binder has been modified so that it can be mixed with water. And this takes place before the mixing and milling of the paint. So the binder, the linseed oil is modified uh, prior to the main, making of the paint. Uh, there's an additive that's introduced to the linseed oil that acts as an emulsifier that allows for the oil to bond with the water to form a stable suspension. And that's what we refer to as the pigment being suspended in the binder. All right, next slide. Uh, well, well, next slide. There we go. So what is this magic ingredient? Uh, uh, we refer to it as an emulsifier. So emulsifiers or emulsifying agents are a compound or a substance uh, that acts as a stabilizer for emulsions. Uh, this prevents liquids like oil and water that are ordinarily wouldn't mix uh, the ability to bond together. The word itself, emulsifier, emulsion comes from the Latin meaning to milk. Uh, a little anecdotal information there. And it's because milk itself is a type of emulsion of water and an animal protein. Uh, another word for emulsifier is emulgent that you'll come across. Emulsifiers are commonly found in nature, man. They're everywhere. They're in our bodies. Uh, they're also common ingredients to many food products. Uh, anything that's in a jar or a can, for example, typically has some type of emulgent or emulsifier in it to keep the ingredients from separating. Uh, in the can or the bottle. So very commonly used in food products. Uh, the emulsifiers on a molecular level, and that's what this diagram shows, have a, a very unique molecule. One end of the molecule is what we refer to as being hydrophilic, means water loving, literally in Greek, hydrophilic. Philic means to love in Greek. Uh, the other end is lipophilic or fat or oil loving. So you can see the little molecules attaching themselves to the oil molecule and then bonding with the water around it. So this is how that emulsifier works in binding the oil and water in your painting process. So let's go ahead and, and go to the next slide. Emulsifiers are not new to art. Uh, the long, long history, all the way back to the origins of painting itself. Uh, the first that I wanna mention here uh, is uh, tempera painting. Tempera painting is egg yolk. Uh, the egg yolk is the binder for the pigment. And the vehicle used is water because egg yolk contains a naturally occurring emulsifier. Uh, I mentioned milk. Milk was a, uh, a milk fat 
It's called casein. Casein pain is still used today. It dates all the way back to ancient Egypt. Uh, it is also an emulsion. So you have this animal fat mixed with the pigment and water used as the vehicle because of the emulsion that's naturally occurring in the milk. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to share soybeans with you. Soybeans are more contemporary. Soybeans are also a drying oil, just like linseed oil or walnut oil are. Uh, it is often used today in the manufacture of mediums like alkids. They use soy oil and alkids to create those wonderful alkid mediums that help uh, speed up oxidation. I have a question, Jeff. Sure, sure. Why do you? Why can't you suspend the pigment just in water? What? It, uh, if all of this is a fat that is suspended in water. Why is the fat necessary? Great question. So pigments uh, are like particles of sand. They don't dissolve. Uh, so if you were to put sugar or salt in water and stir it up, it would dissolve and create a solution. Pigments, you could stir them up in water, but eventually they would sink down to the bottom. So any binder that's used to make paint, whether it's oil or gum arabic for watercolor or acrylic polymer resin for acrylic paints, they have to be able to suspend or hold the pigment in place once it's been stirred. So you need something like the egg yolk or the milk or the drying oil to hold that pigment in place once it's been mixed. Suspension is a key uh, working property of any good paint binder. The other would be adhesion. You need something to stick it to the surface you're painting on. So you could mix the pigment in water and apply it to the surface, but it's not really going to adhere very well. So something like the egg yolk and tempera or the linseed oil and oil paint helps it to stick to the surface. Okay, thank Great you. question. Um, but emulsions, as I was saying, uh, are a type of binder uh, that dates back to the very origins of painting itself and are still used uh, in the making of other paint products today, not just in water mixable oils. I found, uh, next slide, uh, if you will, I found this great reference. I have had this book got it right here. I bought it at a garage sale. It must have been 15, probably 20 years ago now. Uh, and it's uh, written by Frederick Tubbs. It's called The Painter Question and Answer Book. Uh, it was published uh, in 1948, and he did it with Thomas Hart Benton, so another well-known painter uh, who folks may be aware of. And there are a couple other artists who contributed parts to it, too. Uh, Tobbs is probably best known uh, to the general public by lending his name Frederick to a canvas and art materials line, Frederick's Canvases. Uh, but he was also a well-known painter in New York uh, in the middle of the 20th century, who was also an esteemed instructor at the Art Students League in New York City. So a long history uh, that he played, uh, an important role he played in uh, the New York art scene uh, in the middle of the 20th century. But in this book, I was looking in for a totally unrelated issue, but in the back of the book, uh, it's called uh, part three, it's listing miscellaneous media and methods. And I'll just read the excerpts that I got from you because it's related directly to what we're talking about. One of the, the uh, uh, trepidations folks have is, you know, what's the history of this? Is there really, you know, a, a tradition in using water with oil paints? It seems like it's this, this big no-no where in fact, as I mentioned, with the use of emulsions, it's actually been part of the painting or painter's toolbox for many, many years. And this is a, a nice article to support that. So he goes on to describe what he calls oil tempera painting. Uh, and he defines it as the introduction of oil into the egg water medium. And he's very specific about talking about water in this mixture. So the general uses for this medium, he uh, talks about as creating an underpainting for a traditional oil process or for creating an entire painting. He actually goes on uh, after talking about what an emulsion is, just like we did. He goes on to give a formula that you can use to make your own water oil paints, water temper oil paints. Uh, he starts off with two parts egg yolk, three parts water. Uh, and one part stand oil, which is a type of polymerized linseed oil. And he mixes those three together and creates something that he uh, talks about making paint with himself. So he adds dry pigment to it to make his own paint. He also talks about using it as a medium uh, so that he can introduce water as a thinner or a solvent into the process. Uh, and it's just very interesting to read something that folks you know don't really uh, uh, understand as having this great tradition in oil painting. 
you can actually date back this technique all the way back to the early Renaissance. So tempera was favored by many painters in Italy, especially prior to the 15th century. In the 15th century, we've seen this revolution of oil painting beginning in Northern European countries like Flanders and the Netherlands. As it made its way south, a lot of traditional tempera painters would start with tempera and then finish with glazes of oil. And they called this the guazzo technique. Uh, so, so there's another example of kind of this origins of the history of Western oil painting related to this very topic that we're talking about today. And would that be because the uh, the, the oil tempera, uh, the underpainting had less opacity? So the by, by finishing with the oil glazes, that's going to give more luminosity? You're exactly right. Um, the combination, the term guazzo uh, is related. I can't remember the exact translation in Italian, but it's like muddy water or muddy puddle. Uh, so it referred to the opacity of the medium or the, the result that was achieved. And then the oil itself created this kind of gloss and translucency. Oil paints were actually used prior to the 15th century even in medieval times, dating all the way back to the 11th and 12th century. It was really the 15th century with artists like Van Eyck in particular, who did uh, uh, some really marvelous things. First, he discovered that you could polymerize the linseed oil. That means to heat it up. Uh, he was doing both walnut oil and, and linseed oil in this degree, and that changed its consistency and working properties. He also added resins like pine resin to change the consistency. Uh, he added uh, metal salts, uh, to it to as a sicative to help speed up the dry time and also started introducing turpentine as a thinner. Uh, so turpentine wasn't widely available to painters prior to the 15th century. It was used for other things, but painters started to use it around this period, not just to clean around the studio with, but to use in the painting process to create leaner layers of paint in their glazing techniques. Uh, so those four things during the 15th century really created the foundation of what oil became in the Western tradition. Huh. Fascinating. This is really interesting. Okay. So maybe, maybe it's really interesting because I've now been doing it for so many years that it, you know, if back in college, I would have been like, can I go get coffee now? <laughs> now I'm like, wow, that's amazing. It is really interesting. Uh, you know, these, these kind of discoveries for me uh, really led a lot, lead, give a lot of credibility to the use of water mixable oils. Uh, and we'll talk more about the myths here in a minute, but there's a lot of suspicion around the chemistry when in fact the chemistry is more than proven. And today's water mixable oils have probably gone through more testing, uh, rigorous testing than any paint in history, certainly more testing than Van Eyck's uh, paint went through and his are still around. So, so there, there, there's a, a lot of good precedent for this process for artists, yeah. So I wanted to take a little bit of this time to talk about some of the mediums because mediums are an important part of most painters' uh, studio right. practice. Why was Van Eyck so hot to trot with coming with adding all this different stuff to his paint? Just just to mess with stuff, or well, I, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of different reasons for it. Part of it was that you know related to that humanist aspect of the Renaissance itself that was circulating uh, in philosophical circles, you know, the whole revival of, of the classical traditions. But what was really monumental for painters was this desire to represent the natural world as we saw it. So there were things like the development of perspective that helped to create a rational space in the picture plane. And then Van Eyck was really striving to create the illusion of surfaces in nature as they appear. So he is, his experimentations with the oil were to that end. He talks about it, and I quote, the beauty of earthly things, uh, wanting to create a, a, a magical illusion to transport people into the mythology of the Christian tradition, uh, specifically. Uh, he wanted to bring it to life. Uh, and oil paint, because of its tonal range, uh, its intensity of color, the slower drying time, Temper dried very quickly, fresco dried very quickly. Uh, the oil medium allowed them to work up surfaces and those transparent layers of glazes that create that wonderful glowing surface. Uh, it, it's just a marvel. Still today, they're studying and researching how he 
manipulated his materials to create those illusions in, in such a realistic way. Uh, but uh, but those are those are some examples of what was driving force behind the use of oils and the the uh, desire for representational imagery that that mimic the the natural world. All right. So auxiliary. So the, the uh, uh, mediums essentially are what we're talking about here. And there are a lot of different reasons why artists want to introduce these into your painting process. They're not required. You can squeeze the paint out of the tube onto your palette, dip your brush into it and go to town. Uh, so it's not required to have a medium, but mediums will do things to the paint that enable you to explore a lot of different techniques and experience, I think, uh, a more rich uh, painting adventure, if you will. Uh, the auxiliaries can do different things. They change the consistency of the paint. So uh, the paint out of the tube is very buttery. So you can use mediums to make it more thick, more pasta, or to make it more thin uh, and, and uh, flow across the surface more easily. Uh, adding mediums increases the transparency of the color. One of the things that Van Eyck liked, right? Uh, he was creating these transparent glazes of color. Uh, it can alter the drying time. It can slow down the drying time or it can speed up the drying time, depending on the medium you use. And also it can change the finish of the painting. Most mediums will make your oil paint a little glossier. Uh, some maintain the existing one, but there are mediums out there that will make your paint more matte as well. Uh, so these are some basic examples of why a person would want to add a medium into it. Uh, my advice to folks who are starting out with mediums for the first time, moderation, moderation, moderation. You know, start out with a little bit of medium, uh, just a little bit on your brush, for example, and mix that into your paint on the palette and, and get a feel for what that medium does uh, in terms of how it alters the painting experience for you. And then you can go from there. Some of the painting mediums that are currently available uh, for folks right now are our painting medium, which is kind of a general medium. It does all those things above. It makes the paint thinner, more transparent, extends the drying time. It makes it a glossier finish. Glazing medium has a thicker consistency. It's kind of like honey. It's used in techniques like Van Eyck's glazing specifically. Uh, it's slower drying. It's fatter. It's made for that building up of layers. Uh, quick dry medium works very much like the painting medium. Uh, with the addition in that it speeds up the oxidation of the paint film. So it makes your painting dry faster. Uh, the painting paste, which is one of my favorites, uh, maintains the consistency of the paint. So all these other ones will make the paint thinner and uh, flow more easily. The painting paste maintains that impasto feel of the paint while uh, extending it as well. Uh, it does make the paint more transparent, but uh, there's so much pigment in the Cobra Artist Oils uh, that you can get away with adding a lot of that painting paste and still maintain some opacity depending on the pigment that you're using. It uh, does yellow, though. It does yellow, though. I'm, I'm, we'll talk about this. Yeah, more. yeah. Well, that's a great thing to bring up. Anytime that you're adding uh, linseed oil into your paint, you're increasing the potential for the yellowing of the paint. Uh, the painting paste has a lot of linseed oil in, in it. The glazing medium has a lot of linseed oil in it. So over time, uh, depending on how much you add whites or lighter colors, you're going to notice some yellowing. This can also be uh, impacted by the amount of light that the painting itself is getting. Uh, linseed oil is uh, susceptible to light in the environment. I don't know if you've ever noticed a, or watched uh, or been in a museum vault and pulled an old oil painting out. And they're very, very dark. It's not just the old varnish. It's the linseed oil itself. When exposed to the daylight back in the gallery, it lightens back up. Uh, so it, it fluoresces is what the, the technical term is for it. If you're painting with linseed oils and before the painting is dry, you put it in a dark place, uh, that's going to increase the yellowing and darkening of the paint as it's drying and then it can become permanent. Uh, so there are some things to be aware of when you're adding oils. And this is not just with water mixable oils, this is oil painting in general. So anytime you're adding more linseed oil to your paint, uh, just be conscious of that. There are ways to avoid that. Safflower oil. Safflower oil is non-yellowing. It's a little slower drying, um, but uh, uh, when added to linseed oil or added to oil paints, uh, you can fatten them up and create wonderful glazes without the worry of uh, potential yellowing down the road. 
Do you want to do you want to talk about just why there are three different spray varnishes? And I believe well, yeah. So the spray varnish there is a matte, a satin, and a gloss. Uh, one note on varnishes: all varnishes, including those for water mixable oils, contain solvent. So if you're using water mixable oils to eliminate solvents from your studio, you won't want to be using any of these spray varnishes. And the reason for that is is that a varnish is formulated so that it can be removed from the painting at a later date without damaging the underlying paint film. And you need to have a solvent within it uh, in, in terms in order to do that. Uh, so all varnishes uh, have some type of solvent in them to allow that process down the road. And my understanding of the Cobra varnishes is that they really are just a, they are a product that exists because people ask for a varnish for water mixable oils. They right. really, there's nothing particular. There's not a significant difference between them or any other varnish that's out there. You're absolutely right. You could use any other oil varnish over a Cobra painting once it's dry. Uh, six to nine months is the general rule in terms of waiting before you varnish a painting. You know, thicker paintings, the nine months uh, as advised. But you could use any type of varnish on Cobra, and you could use Cobra varnish over any traditional oil painting as well. All right, so some exciting news. So already in our warehouse, soon to be out at retailers everywhere, we have some new mediums for Cobra, and this is really exciting. And these are based on feedback that we get from you out there uh, painting with Cobra. Folks like Charlie has been bugging us for safflower oil since day one, and we finally now are, have it available. So I'll just go through some of these. So first, we have a solvent-free brush cleaner. Now, Cobra is really easy to clean with soap and water. That's one of the things I love about it. Uh, but now we have a brush cleaner specifically formulated for it that also conditions your brushes. So if you're worried about using, you know, uh, you know, fish dish soap and water on your on your expensive uh, brushes, now you have something that's going to condition as well as clean, and and certainly going to be more convenient when you're traveling, right? And don't necessarily have a place to wash your brushes. Uh, so the solvent-free brush cleaner. Next is the water. Wait, 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 question on that. And so is that? Do you just pour a little of that on a, how do you use it? How do you use it? Well, I would put it in like a, a brush cleaning jar okay. uh, in the bottom of it, just like you would with uh, white spirits or, or turpentine, and then agitate the brush towards the bottom of that to get the paint out of it. And then you can wipe it off with a, a paper towel or a painting rake uh, and you're good to go. So you don't need to, you don't really need to use water. In that you case. don't really need to use water with that. I mean, you could certainly put it through that next stage. It would, it would, uh, uh, when it hurt. Um, but if you're traveling or on the road, you don't need it. You just have your little brush cleaner set up there and you're good to go. All right. Okay. Uh, next, we've got water mixable safflower oil and linseed oil. So now you can make your own paint. You could add dry pigments to these. Uh, you could make your own uh, mediums. So say, for example, the painting medium we have out there that you, you feel it's just a little too thick or it's a little too thin. Now you can use these base oils and add water to them to create the consistency that you want. You can mix them up to one to one with water. So you can create some pretty fluid mixtures and still maintain uh, a good paint binder. Uh, the next one is probably the most exciting, uh, uh, and that's the Cobra Medium Mix. So with this medium, you can add it to any traditional oil in a one-to-one -one ratio and make that oil water mixable. Uh, Cobra paint itself has enough of the emulsion in it that you can mix it with traditional oils and maintain water mixability. But now if you've got this huge investment in Rembrandt, for example, uh, and you just want to keep working with those because those colors are, are what you are, are really uh, utilizing the most, now you could add some of this mix to it and have a water mixable paint. Uh, so really going to be a revolutionary product, I think for a lot of folks. Um, and, and just as a sidebar, I would wanna say, if if you try water mixables and they're not for you, and you go wanna go back to conventional oils, you can use your Cobras entirely within the conventional oil. Absolutely, that's a, that's a great thing to bring up. They are a true oil paint. Right. So you could use them with any other oil paint out there and you could use spirits with them. You could right. use turpentine with them. It, it, it's not going to be detrimental to the, the, the results. So, yeah, absolutely. That's a great point to bring up. Uh, and then finally, we've got the solvent-free paint thinner. Uh, and I, 
this is really exciting for me because one of the challenges that some folks have, and this is probably going to be of interest to you too, Charlie, uh, creating those really lean layers. So Cobra has always recommended a one-to-one -one ratio of paint to water. And that gives you a fairly fluid mixture, but not to create really transparent washes like you do mixing turpentine with traditional oils. So now you can use this thinner uh, with your paint uh, to create those wonderful lean layers. Uh, also, there are some folks who don't like the way the water feels with the oils. Uh, and it is slightly different. Uh, there's an emulsion that takes place when you introduce the water into the paint. And for some people who've never painted with them before, there is a slight adjustment uh, to getting used to that. Uh, so the thinner uh, resolves that issue. So when you add this to the Cobra paint, even if you're just looking to thin the paint a little bit out on your palette, uh, this is going to behave just like if you were to add white spirits or turpentine to a traditional oil. Uh, so you don't have to have any difference in your experience of working with the paints and still be solvent free. So, so um, I used to use uh, Windsor Newton when I used Windsor Newton Artisans. Uh, they made a thinner mm -hmm. uh, that w it was slightly greasier feeling than using water. And I liked it, but it does not work very well with the Cobra. So this is specific. Well, this is formulated specifically with the Cobra. Yeah, it should work with other water mixable oils as well, but it's specifically formulated for the Cobra. Now, water mixables, there's some great brands out there available uh, as well as Cobra. Um, there are some that are geared more towards students based on their pigment loads. Um, and then there are different philosophies on how the uh, drying oil is synthesized. Uh, so there are some different working properties from one to the next. Um, uh, I think Cobra uh, is very much like working with Rembrandt. It's a very buttery, uh, mm -hmm. kind of loose paint. It's not stiff. Uh, it's something that's easy to spread across the surface without a lot of manipulation with any type of mediums or thinners. So all by itself, it's very painter friendly. Uh, and these mediums just expand the vocabulary of what you can experience and achieve with the paint. All right, well, we're getting lots of people being very excited with these additions to the uh, to the to the uh, to the menu, um, and I'm I'm super excited. I've been using the uh, the uh, safflower and the linseed in the studio, and they're they're wonderful. I use them as my mediums. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. No, I mean these these are super exciting. It really rounds off and makes complete. Uh, the possibilities of working with the Cobra compared to uh, other traditional oil techniques. Right. Uh, this, this, uh, Katie says that the the medium medium mix is is exciting for her as well. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to dispel some of the myths out there or assumptions that are made about water miscible oils in general. So I'm not just talking about Cobra here, I'm talking about water miscible oils in general. So the first misconception is that they contain water. I hear this all the time, those water-based oils. Water-based oils. Yeah, there's no water in the tube. It's your drying oil binder and the pigment uh, and you're good to go. So no water in the paint, you only add the water. Uh, there's a lot of folks who think it's not a true oil paint, that somehow there's a different binder or there's something else going on, and that's false. It is definitely a true oil paint by every definition, uh, that they dry faster than traditional oils, and this is false. Now, different pigments dry at different speeds, different manufacturers' paints dry at different rates than other manufacturers' paints. Uh, so when I say they dry faster than traditional oils, uh, um, and that being false, I'm speaking in general terms. I think the biggest myth here is that because you can mix water with them, that they dry quickly like acrylics do, and they don't at all. They are going to have all the general working properties of an oil paint, just like you would expect, uh, with variations uh, based on the pigments that are contained in each different color. Uh, the next is that they cannot be mixed with traditional oils, and this is false. They can absolutely be mixed, as we already mentioned, with any other oil paint out there. You don't have to use water with them, uh, but, uh, but they can be mixed with any other oil or oil medium. Uh, the only thing that I would mention there is that when you do mix them with other oils or you mix them with other oil mediums that aren't water mixable, it does mitigate the water miscibility of them, so it becomes more like a traditional oil. 
Uh, a lot of folks think that they work like acrylics and that's false. They're nothing like acrylics. Uh, acrylics uh, evaporate. That's how their binder uh, dries. So that's a very rapid chemical process. Oils oxidize. That's a very slow chemical process. Uh, the way that they handle on the surface, uh, completely different. Their drawing time, all sorts of different aspects. So uh, they are not anything like acrylics. Uh, some folks uh, ask if they can be mixed with acrylics. Now, we don't recommend that. There are some manufacturers who say it's okay. And I know some artists who are committed to this process. The reason we do not recommend it is just for the reason I mentioned, the way that they dry. Oil uh, is very temperamental as it oxidizes. This is why we have the fat over lean rule. Uh, if uh, that layer of paint is robbed of its ability to absorb oxygen from the atmosphere, it leads to cracking, it leads to wrinkling, it leads to peeling from the surface. There's all sorts of bad things that can happen. Because acrylics dry so fast, depending on how they are mixed in with the paint or layered in with the oil paint, you could potentially create some really bad issues with the painting down the road. So we don't recommend it. You know, artists are going to do what artists are going to do. I get it. Um, but uh, we don't recommend that they be mixed with acrylics. Uh, another misconception or myth out there is that they're not archival, and that's completely false. These are an archival paint, as I mentioned before, thoroughly tested, uh, probably more so than any oil paint in history. Uh, and then the last one that's false is somehow they have less pigment. Uh, that the synthesis of the linseed oil means that it doesn't have the same absorption qualities. And that's completely false. Matter of fact, the ingredients that are used to create the emulsion in oil paints, they're referred to as something called surfactants. And surfactants have been used in the making of oil paints for many, many years. They are used as a wetting agent. They help to increase the absorption uh, of oil into the pigments. And they're used depending on, on the absorption level or the surface tension of one pigment to the next. So the introduction of a surfactant into the synthesis of the linseed oil to make it water miscible does not change the absorption of the pigment, meaning the pigment saturation or what we call critical pigment volume is not affected uh, by uh, the fact that the linseed oil is water mixable. So there's no less pigment in Cobra Artist than there is in Rembrandt. And then just for fun, I get this question a lot. You know, why do we call it Cobra oil paint? Uh, there are no venomous snakes lurking the canals of Amsterdam, right? <laughs> so where does the name come from? It actually comes from this group of painters uh, called the Cobra Art Movement. It was a post-World War II art movement, and it started in three cities, uh, or the artists were from three cities, Copenhagen, Brussels, and Amsterdam. So the term or the name Cobra comes from the first letters of the cities of where these artists called home, Copenhagen, Brussels, Amsterdam, Cobra. Uh, Cobra was uh, a contemporary movement, very much akin, or I should say a late modern painting movement, very much akin to abstract expressionism in the United States. Happened around the same time, uh, some of the same interests in surrealist uh, automatism, this automatic painting. They were also interested in Nordic myths and what they refer to as primitive art, which we would call outsider art today, uh, they wanted to be freed from the conventions of academic oil painting. Uh, that was their main motto. And you can see here, Kerr Apple, who was the Dutchman. I don't know if you can see him in this picture. He's got that cool plaid coat back there, uh, the, the dapper mustache. Uh, but he is quoted as saying, we don't want to be understood. We want to be freed. And we took that as inspiration for Cobra, this idea of being freed from the conventions of traditional oil painting. So you'll see the word infinite freedom on a lot of our marketing pieces and packaging for the product. And then finally, I want to make a quick announcement. This is super fun. Now, most people have probably seen uh, Loving Vincent. It was a wonderful movie that was made in Poland. Uh, it was about uh, kind of Van Gogh's last days. Uh, and it was completely hand painted and they actually used our Van Gogh oils to create it. So you had a hand painted animated full feature film it was nominated for an Academy Award uh, animated features and, and super beautiful painting to watch. So the same company that made Loving Vincent has created a new film called The Peasants. It's based on a Polish folk story, uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, story. Uh, and it's also 100 percent hand painted. There were 70 artists involved. They worked in four different studios in Poland and Ukraine. When the war began, they all moved to uh, Poland. 
uh, over 200,000 hours of painting into this process. They used 1,300 liters of Cobra oil paint. So they used Cobra to create the whole painting. Uh, part of the reason is, and I don't know, I don't have a picture of it here, but uh, you can see the artist working in the cubicle creating the painting. Well, she's in a room with about 12 other artists working on these uh, images for the film. They're stills for the film. So with all those artists uh, having solvent, really makes for a toxic environment. So having the Cobra really made it more comfortable for them to work together in groups like this. Uh, the film premiered to much acclaim at the Toronto Film Festival this fall, and it's uh, due to be released uh, mostly in art house theaters this year. It was supposed to be autumn 2023. It looks like it got pushed back to this year now. But if you want to learn more about the Peasants movie, uh, go to thepeasantsmovie.com. And then we have a couple sets that are going to be available at retailers that celebrate the film. They're based on the palettes they used for the portraiture and landscape uh, that they created for the film. Uh, and those will be available soon. I just want to give a quick shout of that. But uh, definitely check out the link. There's a wonderful trailer for it. And it's just visually stunning uh, the way they've been able to take the oil paint and create the animation that comes to life uh, in an incredible way. So definitely worth checking out. Cool. Well, Jeff, now we do have some questions. All right. Good and I'm going to th throw them up here. Um, first off, let's see. Someone earlier, I just think that all the comments are in a row here, so I've just got to find them all. Okay. Wendy said she used the painting paste recently, and it seemed to take absolutely forever to dry. Was she dreaming? It does take longer to dry. So anytime that you're adding additional linseed oil, which is the majority of what's in the painting paste, it's going to extend the drying time. So the more you add, the slower the paint film is going to take to dry. Plus, normally, at least the way I paint with the painting paste, I'm not sure how Wendy was doing it. You're painting in thicker layers of paint, uh, you know, really, you know, that impasto type of techniques. I use a palette knife with the way I work with it. Uh, it's going to take longer to dry because you've got a lot more paint on the surface. But anytime you add a medium, depending on how fat the medium is, you're going to extend the drying time. All right. And now the, the painting paste, I was using it a couple of years ago, trying to kind of come up with a faux, uh, a faux encaustic look. Mm -hmm. So I was using it very, very thickly with with just like a little bit of titanium white or titanium buff in there to give it a little bit of an opacity. And that's what yellowed on me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so you're 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 saying the ideal use for the painting paste would be to mix a healthy amount of pigment in with it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean I usually don't go more than one to one. Okay. 50-50 in mixing it. Uh the more transparent, the lighter the pigment, the more likely you're going to experience some of that yellowing. Right. Uh, so I don't add it in large amounts to whites, uh, for example. If you're just adding a small amount of white to the paste, you're going to get a lot of yellowing. Yeah, for sure. That's what I got. So Dale says that uh, I have several paintings using copper oils that I want to paint over, but I cannot use oil primer or acrylic primer. Any advice? I would disagree. I would think, let me give my untutored answer first. I would sand it down lightly to get rid of any glossiness so there's a little tooth there. And then I'd use an oil primer. An oil 100%. Primer. 100% correct. Yeah. So even though you're adding water into the paint as you're painting, that water evaporates out pretty quickly. Uh, within three days, there's going to be no trace of water left in that painting. And what you're going to be left with is a true linseed oil paint film. Uh, so you can put any type of oil back over the top of it. Uh, you wouldn't be able to use the acrylic gesso over the top of it. Even if you sand it, there's going to be uh, adhesion problems. Um, but any type of oil primer back over the top of that, just fine. Just like with a traditional oil painting. I use, I do something that drives you and Kyle crazy. I, if I've got a terrible painting, I will sometimes sand it down a little slap a couple of coats of kills on top of that, and then put uh, acrylic gesso on top of that. And, but generally that's on um, 
rigid surfaces. That's how I justify it. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. want to do it on stretchy canvas, but on a rigid surface, I think I'm probably, I'll be dead before anyone cares. <laughs> there will be some conservator 50 years from now, Charlie, that will be cursing your name, but... <laughs> No, I, I mean, I think Kyle's concern and my my concern would be just the archival quality of the Kills paint. It's it's a great product. I, I used it to paint my basement. <laughs> um, and, but I think you're smart in putting it on a, a firm surface because the more flexibility in the surface, uh, that paint film is probably not a very durable one. So the sturdier the surface, the more longevity you're giving to it. Plus, you're painting over it, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So you're painting over in it and each layer of paint you put over it is adding strength to it uh, to kind of encase it in, in a stronger uh, paint film with the linseed oil. Uh, so, so I doubt anybody's going to come after you uh, oh, in the right. future, but uh, as a manufacturer, right. I would not recommend it to the general public. <laughs> exactly. Beth asks the time frame for when the new mediums will be available in stores in the, in the States. I don't have an answer to that. We have it in our warehouse, so it's ready to ship. Uh, we were just talking about an event, uh, uh, Charlie and I, called Creative World in Frankfurt. And that's where most, uh, Frankfurt, Germany, that's where most art companies, art manufacturers launch new products. There are art buyers, art retailers, art manufacturers from all over the world who descend on Frankfurt to show off their new goods. And we were showing off these there. Uh, there were retailers, uh, including major retailers here from the US who were there. So I would imagine within the next month or so, you'll start to see these featured uh, online first probably. Uh, and then you'll start to see them uh, trickle into some of the larger retail stores that carry Cobra currently. But uh, I'm confident that everybody who is currently selling Cobra oil paints will be selling these mediums eventually because they are such a welcome uh, addition to the line. Um, let's see. Katie asks, says she's been using walnut oil with Cobra paints. Is that the one that yellows? No. Actually, no. No. Walnut oil is uh, is wonderful in the sense that it is non-yellowing. Uh, and it dates back all the way to the Renaissance. A lot of those early Renaissance paintings were made with walnut oil. It's a very strong binder. Not quite as strong uh, as linseed oil, but still very reliable. Uh, it uh, makes a very uh, a good paint film overall. Um, and it's non-yellowing, which is one of the great features of it. It's also used by a lot of artists who are painting solvent-free as their solvent. Uh, you know, solvents really are defined more how we use them than by what their chemical makeup is. Uh, turpentine, white spirits, now odorless mineral spirits have become favorite solvents for using in oil paints. But other oils, other drying oils, can be used in the role of a solvent too. And walnut oil is often chosen for that. I think the only downside to walnut oil is that it can rot. Uh, yeah, it can stink up your studio. Uh, it'll be your own memento mori, a little corpse in the corner uh, if you're not monitoring. So you want to make sure it's closed, airtight, and some artists throw it in the fridge just to make sure. And, and I know of an artist who had mice eating the corner of his painting. So. <laughs> it's tasty, yeah. It's generally more expensive than linseed oil. Uh, it's a little slower drying than linseed oil, but not extremely so. Um, a, a lot of artists uh, swear by it, uh, mainly as a medium. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, there is a brand, I think Graham still right. makes a walnut binder for their paints in the manufacturing process. I, th I think you're right on that. Now, Charlie asks, uh, can the solvent-free thinner be used with traditional oil? Yeah, I mean, you could, absolutely. So it would be a way to paint solvent-free with your traditional oil. Now, it won't make your paint water soluble. It won't make the paint water miscible. You can't add the thinner to the paint and then add water to it. But you could use it in place of turpentine white spirits or odorless spirits yeah. in your traditional painting process. Yeah. Well, oh, you couldn't do that with the uh, with the the artisan thinner. The artisan thinner was, I think, it's glycerin and water. Exactly. So I'm throwing that out there based on the information I have now. If that changes, I'll certainly let everybody know. But uh, my understanding is that you can use it just fine. It's uh, based on an alkyd type resin, uh, from what I've read. A lot of these things are proprietary, so they're held very close to the 
the chest, so to speak, uh, in our labs and manufacturing facility in the Netherlands. Um, but uh, I, I am, uh, I've been told that it's an alkyd type of resin and alkyd resins are more than compatible with traditional oils. If that changes, uh, I'll be the first to, to put an announcement out there. But to the best of my knowledge, you can use it with any oil paint. Yeah, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, one, one of the things I, I, I'm proud of about Reasonably Fine Art Talks is that we are not shilling for a particular point of view. Yeah, I'm a Royal Talons ambassador, but I really like the company. I really like what it does. But we aren't just giving you happy horse shit. We are, we are really trying to solve people's painting problems here. So 100%, 100%. Um, Sandra says, if you use regular oils with water mixable medium, how do you clean the brushes? So unless, so all the mediums with the exception of the medium mix do not have enough emulsifier in them to make the paint, the traditional paint water miscible. So let's say you're using the water mixable linseed oil, or you're using the water mixable painting medium and you're mixing them into your traditional paints. You're still going to need a solvent to clean those paint brushes. Um, that doesn't change it. Uh, only the medium mix will allow you to paint with traditional oils, add water, and clean up with soap and water. All the rest of them, if you're using them all by themselves with traditional oils, it doesn't make them water miscible. Okay. Um, a couple of questions that are very, very similar. If I have the choice, should they use oil primer or acrylic prime canvases for Cobra? And then... Um, I was told that water mixable oils can only be applied to gessoed surface, I assume, acrylic. So the same question there. Yeah, yeah. So um, we recommend that you use an acrylic or universal prime. Uh, so that's definitely the recommendation. And the reason is, is that as soon as you add water to your paint, if that's part of your printing process, if you are working on an oil primed surface, there's going to be some beading and some resistance and it's going to affect the drying time and it could create some other types of problems. 90% of the canvases that are sold pre-stretched out there are pre-primed or primed with acrylic gesso or universal priming it's called. Uh, so it's really not something you have to worry about. Uh, if it's an oil prime surface it will specifically say oil primed or oil panel. Uh, for those folks who like to work on traditional oil panels or oil prime surfaces, you can use Cobra on it, but you it's not recommended that you add water to it then. So the paint right out of the tube mixed with one of these mediums is gonna to apply to an oil prime surface just fine. But as soon as you introduce water into it, you're gonna create some problems with yourself. So that's why we recommend the acrylic prime canvases or the universal prime canvases, just to avoid all those problems. I, I use, uh oil primed uh, panels at one event about eight years ago. And it, it worked fine, even with the thin way I paint. But a year later, virtually all the, the panels had developed hairline cracks. And you know how thin I work. So I mean, there wasn't any real danger of the paint flaking off. Uh, and what I did was I mixed an oily, an oily mix with a very little bit of pigment in it and kind of buffed it into the surface and it looked okay. But it just, it, it, you could tell it was not the native world for water mixable oils. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, the biggest problem uh, that would, you would encounter using Cobra mixed with water on an oil prime surface is it's going to impact the drying time. Uh, some it's going to take forever to dry in some places. Um, and uh, to your point, potentially down the road, that's going to compromise the paint film and you could get cracking and peeling as a, as a result. So uh, we recommend acrylic prime surfaces. If you have to use oil prime surfaces, that's your go to surface. You can use a Cobra with the mediums, just no water. Now, Carolyn asks, how thin can you comfortably go, i.e. a Bernie Fuchs style, or I assume like a, a, a nice, just a nice wipeout? You can go totally thin. I mean, yeah, so, so the manufacturing recommendation is not to exceed one to one, one part water to one part paint. So that's not a super fluid mixture. Um, artists who shall be unnamed exceed that all the time. Uh, 
the the important thing or the important recommendation or point here is what your final paint film is going to be. So let's say I've got a can of water and I add just a touch of color to it and I wash that over my surface. Um, but that's my first lean layer. And then I'm going to paint another layer. I'm going to paint another layer, all a prima glazing, however. Uh, it's those final layers that are going to give integrity to the final paint film. The water's already evaporated away from those lower surfaces, just like turpentine evaporates away out of your paint. Uh, and that becomes part of the process. Um, uh, so, you know, how most people paint, it doesn't pose a big problem. But we put that recommendation in there just so you know that when you thin out the paint too much, and this is true with traditional oils and turpentine, if you add too much turpentine to the paint, it keeps the little particles of oil from bonding together as strongly. Uh, same thing here with the water and the cobra. I have found a cheat or a sneak around that. And that is I pre-mix the painting medium with water one-to-one. -one. And that creates a very fluid medium, but has enough binder in it uh, to create a cohesive paint film. Then I can add just a tiny bit of pigment to that and wash it on. And I get that wonderful dripping uh, and uh, washes like watercolor almost, but there's enough oil in it uh, that it creates a stable paint film. And you could leave that as the final surface. Ooh. We now also have the thinner, right? So the thinner is going to, you know, make it even easier. Oh, that's fantastic. I got to try that. Um, yeah. Now, Dale love, love, loves Cobra Quick Dry. I hate, hate, hate Cobra Quick Dry because <laughs> I can't clean, clean, clean my brushes. It gets into the, it, it to me gets in there and, you know, two days later, you've got a nice stiff brush that you have to use bristle magic on to, to bring back. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you recommend cleaning uh, brushes after the quick dry medium? Yeah, so, so the quick dry the quick dry medium has become very popular, especially with plain air painters. Uh, you know, you're working on those small panels outside and, and uh, traveling. And so it, it definitely makes it more convenient. It tacks up within 24 hours and, and you can slide it into your canvas carrier. So, so it's got a lot of, of wonderful features. Um, what makes it dry more quickly uh, is the addition of what we call a siccative. Uh, siccatives uh, uh, synthesize the uh, oil to allow it to absorb more oxygen more rapidly. Uh, so what's happening, what you're describing with your brushes is that same thing is happening in your bristles and it's tacking up and getting sticky much more quickly. Uh, so a couple of ways to mitigate that. One would be to make sure you're thoroughly cleaning your brushes throughout your painting process. Uh, so not to leave a lot of the quick dry medium in your paint on your brush during your painting, you know, uh, studio practice. Uh, after the fact, um, it's nice to uh, reactivate it with a little oil. So you could just put a little more oil back on the brush uh, mm -hmm. and uh, mix that around before you wash it with soap and water. Uh, now we have the brush cleaner that should also make it easier to get that out. Um, All right. But uh, but keeping your brushes clean during the painting process and reactivating uh, them with a little oil first before you add the soap and water are two ways to get better results. The reactivating seems like a really good idea. So uh, now Wendy says that I said at a workshop that I rub walnut oil on the panel before starting. Uh, I, I any oil I will sometimes oil the panel out because it allows me to move the paint around very very easily. Another instructor was aghast about that. What do you say? It all depends on what you're doing over the top of that layer, uh, right? So they're probably referring or they're, they're shocked because they're referring to this fat over lean principle. Um, so when you paint fat over lean, you're typically building up multiple layers. This is very common in, in glazing techniques. Uh, the fatter the paint means a higher oil content. The leaner the paint means the lower the oil content. And typically we start with leaner paints and build up to fatter paints. So to oil out with just oil, with not mixed with some type of solvent or thinner, appears to be contradictory to that fat over lean. But it really depends on what you're doing over the top of it and whether or not you're waiting for that layer to dry or not. Now, you can talk about your, your technique a little bit, but if you're oiling out and that oil is still wet and then you're painting directly into it with paint out of the tube or another mixture of paint and medium, you're not going to experience any problems. You're, you're essentially painting all a prima. 
And all the Prima kind of gets you off the hook for some of that fat over lean process. You can glob on paint uh, uh, and uh, uh, create your surface at will without having to worry about the fat over lean oxidation process. But if you're doing a layer, waiting for it to dry, then doing another layer, waiting for it to dry in succession like that, having a fatter layer over uh, underneath a leaner layer could cause problems. Right. I think I think that's I mean, and I no longer use the walnut oil. I just had a little sample thing of it that I used. I now use when I've got when it's like really uh, low humidity and the my thin, thin layer is going to set up immediately. I will put down a little bit of water mixable safflower oil uh, just to, to keep it to keep it from uh, drying out immediately. Um, now, there was a very good question here. These are all great questions, folks. Yeah, Thank I, you so I, much for being here. Do you have to get going? Uh, is it okay if we keep you a couple more minutes? Absolutely. Absolutely. I am uh, here for all of you for as long as we need. Casper and us talk about using cold wax with Cobras. I've just been using cold wax with Cobras, and I love it. I mean, you all, you talk about it, Jeff. And that yeah, one. yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lori uses cold wax, too. Uh, yeah. Lori McNee, for folks who, who don't know her. Um, she uses cold wax quite frequently um, in it. It gives it that kind of encaustic look. Uh, the only uh, thing that you need to be aware of when you're adding cold wax, depending on how much you're putting in there, uh, two things. One, it's going to mitigate the water miscibility of the paint. So the more cold wax you put into the paint, the less you're going to be able to add water to it. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing to keep in mind is if you're painting solvent free because you have an issue with the solvents, a health issue, cold wax contains solvents. So just be aware of that. If you're painting with the Cobra for other reasons, convenience, environmental, whatnot, uh, the cold wax isn't going to be as much of a challenge there. But it does contain solvent and it will mitigate the water miscibility of the paint. But other than that, it's completely compatible and you can get some great effects with it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting stuff. Uh, Let's see, I'll just go through. She tried 30 years ago, didn't like them more alkids. Maybe they're better now. She hated the texture. <laughs> you know, I hated them back then too. Right. <laughs> I remember when some of the first generations of water mixable oils came out, it was back in the seventies. Um, and a couple things about those early generations. First, the manufacturers of those paints did not see them as a professional artist tool. Uh, they were creating them because there were, this was, you know, in the 70s, this was the beginning of ecology and environmental awareness and, and how our materials in the studios were impacting our health and the environment. Uh, so they were creating them as an answer to that, but they really saw it as a paint for enthusiasts uh, and uh, they didn't put a lot of pigment in it. And the way that the oils were synthesized back then was more like what they do with detergents today. Uh, so it created kind of a gummy consistency when you added the water to it uh, because there weren't a lot of pigment in the paints. You didn't really get good color mixtures uh, and it was by design. So, so uh, uh, today uh, there are several manufacturers, Royal Talons being one of them, who's elevated the uh, formulations of these paints uh, to include pigment loads that match other artist grade paints that we make as well as improving the synthesis of the oils uh, to have a better result, more akin to what you would expect with a traditional oil. Actually borrowing from those old chemistries that we talked about uh, earlier on. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, old is new again. Uh, Katie says she has the habit of using a baby wipe with Cobra transparent red oxide. She asking for trouble introducing moisture from the baby wipe. I assume it's some mixture, including rubbing alcohol. Yeah, you know, I've never used them in the paint itself. I, I've certainly kept that, especially when I'm plain air painting. I have some baby wipes there to kind of wipe my hands off and the, uh, my palette and brushes and whatnot. You're right. They contain alcohol um, in them, which evaporates very quickly. Uh, yeah. So I don't think you're going to create any issues. I'm imagining you're going in with a baby wipe and kind of wiping out areas of paint. I'm just guessing that that's how you're doing it. I don't think that's going to pose a problem. The alcohol that's sure. in the baby wipe evaporates out pretty quickly. Now, sometimes they also have oils in them. Uh, mineral oil is an ingredient in some baby wipes, so it's smoother on baby, right, than, a, than just a cleaning wipe. Um, mineral oil does not 
dry, Perfect. doesn't Perfect. oxidize, it stays wet forever. It's what's used in oil pastels. But I don't think there's enough of that oil on the baby wipe to create an issue. You would really have to be soaking the surface with the baby wipe. Um, so I think that you're going to be okay doing what I think you're doing, uh, wiping out the surface with the baby wipe and then painting back in. All right, we're gonna just do a couple more. Um, she likes the cold wax with Cobra, especially for using a painting knife. What about varnishing it if you want an even look? That'll work fine, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Wait that six months period. Uh, and then you can use the Cobra varnish or any other varnish to unify the surface. You can also oil out. Now we've got linseed oil and safflower oil. So you could use those to oil out the surface after it's dry to the touch. Uh, and that allows you to unify the surface as well. Um, somebody asked me once if you can use the Gamvar, which is the Gamblin varnish that is uh, that you can use when the painting's dry to the touch. It still allows the paint film to oxidize. That's totally fine to use with Cobra too. Uh, just keep in mind, you know, whatever water you add to the paint evaporates out, just like whatever turpentine or white spirits you add to the paint evaporates out. So when it's dry to the touch, there's no more water in it. You're essentially dealing with an oil painting uh, paint film, just like any other traditional oil painting film. This is a very good. This is a very good question because we do need to be clear about this. Are the cadmium colors safe? Cadmiums, any of the heavy metals, are just as toxic in water miscible as they are in conventional oils. They're just, yeah, know. pigments Pigments are universal. So we use the same pigments in oils, watercolors, acrylics, gouache, right. you name it. So cadmiums are cadmiums regardless of the binder or the type of paint you're, you're buying. So if you're using cadmiums, if you're using cobalts, uh, you need to make sure your studio practice is, is uh, conscious of that. And there are safe ways to work with those pigments. Uh, to avoid any kind of health issues or environmental issues. Uh, so I love cadmiums, uh, you know, couldn't paint without them. Uh, there are some great substitutes. Cobra does have some CAD substitutes in the line. Uh, they're referred to uh, as permanents. Uh, so we've got a CAD uh, lemon yellow, for example, but we also have a permanent lemon yellow in the line. So there are some uh, pigments in Cobra uh, that are substitutes for those if you wanna banish those from your practice. But Charlie's 100% right. Cadmium's cadmium regardless of the binder. Right, and I mean, and it's, it's counterintuitive in a way. I mean, like watercolor, it seems so benign, but a cobalt in watercolor is a cobalt. Still a cobalt. And actually it's even more of an issue in watercolor because gum Arabic does not encase the pigment it's absorbed into the paper and you're kind of left with the pigments on the surface of the, the uh, that you're painting on the watercolor paper itself. So it's those pigments in the air that pose a health problem to us. Uh, so the pigments are more exposed in watercolor in oils and acrylics. When those binders uh, dry or oxidize in the case of oils, the, those pigments are encased and safe and, and not going to pose any problem. Oh, well, we're going to do one last question, which is, Tempera under oil paint. Tempera from Royal Towns Casein, medium made from regular oils. So, so Tempera um, is specifically an egg yolk binder with pigment. That's what I'm referring to. Tempera paints are also used as a name for the paints we used to use when we were in elementary school, right? Uh, and they're not an archival artist product. So I'm not referring to those. So I'm referring specifically to tempera painting where artists are uh, adding dry pigments into egg yolk as the binder and using water uh, as the vehicle uh, or the solvent, if you will. Uh, there are some manufacturers out there that make pre-made ones. Uh, off the top of my head, it's escaping me right now. <laughs> but uh, but the, they uh, have other things in them as well. <clears throat> um, but uh, I, there's actually a fun exercise that I used to do with some of the workshops. <clears throat> we would take Rembrandt oil paint and an egg yolk, and we would add the Rembrandt oil paint into the egg yolk and mix it up and get this nice, you know, really kind of shiny color. Uh, and then we could wet our brushes with water and go into that paint and use it as the vehicle. So we we're literally using the egg yolk as an emulsifier or the Rembrandt as a pigment for the tempera process. So it was an example of how to paint in that oil tempera process that Frederick Tobbs was talking about. Interesting. Well, um, 
Let's see. Oh, okay. Here's a very good last question from from Beth, which is because it's a good question. We all do need to think about what to do with wastewater, rags, paper towels, no solvent. Right. Okay. Right. So this is yeah. So you still have to practice safe studio uh, procedure when you're working with oil paints in general. So these are true oil paints. They're a linseed oil binder, Cobra that is, and water mixable oils in general. So all the precautions around linseed oil still pertain to water mixable oils. Uh, so one of the big questions is, you know, will they combust? Uh, linseed oil, uh, if deprived uh, of oxygen, can heat up in your waste bin and can spontaneously combust. There's plenty of wood shop uh, around the, the country, around the world who's had this. Uh, there are different ways to prevent that. Washing out your paint rags very thoroughly with soap and water and hanging them to dry will prevent that. Uh, they do make metal containers that seal that you can throw your paint rags into and they seal up and prevent the combustion from happening or if there is any kind of combustion, it's contained within the metal container. Uh, so that's one way that some artists deal with the paint rags uh, in the studio. Uh, you have banished solvents from the process, so you don't have to worry about them. They're even more flammable and combustible. So getting rid of them gives you a, an extra layer of safety for sure. As far as disposing of them, uh, the wastewater you get from cleaning your brushes and whatnot, the main issue here is what we were just talking about, and that's with pigments, right? So the linseed oil itself is not harmful. It's a vegetable oil. You know, it, it's no different than, than putting some olive oil down your drain, uh, depending on how much you're dumping down there. For the individual studio, uh, the individual artist, uh, um, it's very different than, say, a classroom environment or a workshop environment with a lot of people who are disposing of it. Uh, most of those type of environments, they have some kind of waste disposal unit for you to dump your wastewater. A couple things that you can do, uh, and this is true for acrylic painters too, uh, as much as Cobra painters. So you've got your little jar or your bucket of water that you've been cleaning your brush in as you go. Uh, you just set that bucket aside uh, and you let it sit for 24 hours. The pigments are going to settle at the bottom. And so you can drain off the water down the drain uh, and all those pigments will remain in the form of a sludge. You've probably seen this, you know, where you just left your studio one day and got back a couple of days later and you had this sludge at the bottom uh, of your wastewater. You see a similar thing with your turpentine or your mineral spirits too, where the pigments settle at the bottom and you can pour off that solvent and use it again and dispose of the sludge. Same thing here. Uh, one thing that helps with it is to let that sludge, you know, dry in a separate container or put it in a sealed container before you dispose of it and you'll be just fine. Uh, and then you can dump that wastewater out. There are additional steps uh, and tools that are available for folks who really want to take it to the next level. There are buckets that have filtration systems and a combination of different types of chemicals that help to purify the water one extra step before you dump it down the drain or reuse it in your painting studio process. Uh, so those are worth seeking out. Um, but uh, just in general, letting those pigments settle on the bottom, pouring off the water, and then disposing of those pigments in a trash container is the way to go. Great. Well, I think this has been absolutely terrific, Jeff. Uh, Thank you. It's great and, to be here. Oh, and we've got, we've got a good number of people watching. Several join late and ask questions that we dealt with earlier. So I just don't want to revisit that again and again, but this has just been terrific and exactly what I was hoping we could do really a nice deep dive into the world of Cobras. So let's do it again soon. And, uh, and I hope to see you down the road and you take care of that back now. My I friend. am. I'm being good. I'm being a good patient. All right. And everybody <laughs> thank else. you, everybody. Yeah, it's great to see some familiar faces in the list of comments there. And, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. All right. Thank you all. And we'll see you next week for another Reasonably Fine Art Talk. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone.